Today we will discuss about uh, one of the underrated uh, cinema cinema uh, moments and cinema industries which we have seen till now and today that is the Latin American cinema. Okay, Latin American cinema. Uh, before I speak about Latin American cinema, let me tell you uh, a brief about Latin America. Latin America is those parts of America, especially the South uh, America continent, where they speak more of Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and uh, and other other types of uh, indigenous languages. English, uh, French are a little less over there. Uh, they they were mostly colonized by Spain and Portugal, uh, just like how India and America were colonized by uh, British. And Africa, most of the northern Africa was colonized by France. South America was mainly colonized by Spanish and Portuguese people. So that part of the world is known as Latin America. And Latin America has its own uh, uh, vibrant cinema industry. It's like uh, it's one of the most diverse cinemas around. Latin American cinema is one of the most vibrant and diverse the cinema in the world. It actually refers to um, the, it's collect it's a collective. Latin American cinema is a collective. That means that it doesn't represent one country like Iranian cinema or French cinema or American cinema. Uh, Latin American cinema uh, basically means that it is a collective of film industries of Latin America. So we have many film industries, many countries over there and uh, there are many film industries which have been going on in uh, Latin America. Latin American film is both rich and diverse uh, but the main centers of production have been three countries uh, till now who have taken the lead, who have considered the tripartite of uh, Latin American cinema, the triangle of Latin American cinema. One is Argentina, uh, one is Brazil, and the other one is Mexico. Now you can see uh, here how big the continent is, how big uh, the film industry can be, and you can see uh, that uh, there are these, these things are marked over here. Mexico, uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, they are the, the, the three most important industries but that doesn't mean that there are no other industries but these three are the most important uh, film industries from the beginning and even now these three countries, these three cinema industries have defined and uh, uh, dictated what cinema has to be when it comes to um, Latin American cinema. Now, uh, we have understood about uh, Latin American uh, continent, that is the South American continent. It's important that you understand uh, the con continent of America and South, South America in particular. Uh, you can see that in, 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 if you look at the world map, you can see North America is of course on top, South America is down. North America and uh, the represents the something what we call as Anglo America, that is uh, the English speaking America. Whereas Latin America is has always been a space that opposes Anglo America. Just look at the currencies which are there in uh, Latin America. The currency itself is a tool for resistance against uh, cultural, economic, and political influence of United States. Uh, we cannot deny the fact that United States and uh, the white world, the first world has uh, taken a lot of liberties in South America, which has made South Americans be very, very about, uh, be suspicious about um, uh, the Anglo-America Anglo, uh, America and their motives to culture. Mainly, uh, if you look at the history, there have been interferences by the Anglo-American sphere in Latin American sphere through 
uh, direct and indirect we'll see how it has influenced uh, cinema also uh, basically uh, the coming back again latin america is opposes the anglo um, uh, america and it's made up of many spanish speaking countries actually uh, and one particularly very large portuguese speaking country known as brazil uh, other non indigenous languages non indigenous means the ones who are not uh, native to south america uh, sorry south america in non indigenous languages in south america with more than 1 million speakers is english uh, with 5 million speakers and italian with 2 million speakers but spanish and portuguese far outstrip together they are around 400 a uh, 70 million people who speak these two languages spanish being much uh, higher spoken more than one country speaks whereas portuguese is spoken only in brazil okay so let's uh, let's take uh, uh, now let's take a uh, uh, short journey into the uh, history of silent history of uh, latin american cinema and then we'll come to the contemporary cinema what are the influences uh, they have they have had and what are the influences they have uh, done over other film industries what is the situation now and uh, how different is latin cinema and what are the similarities with other world cinema so we'll get into this immediately okay let's start with way back as we do for every the uh, cinema we have seen till now we have to go back to where the cinema started in that particular uh, industry so we'll start with the silent cinema of latin america uh, there's a word we need to understand that is criollos c r i o l o s a uh, silent uh, many um, uh, expert film experts have said that latin american cinema was a cinema in the beginning the silent cinema was and for criollos uh, now we need to understand what this word criollo means uh, by the 17th century this term the word criollo in spanish uh, referred to the descendants of Sp- uh, spanish speaking people who had originally colonized uh, south america uh, but after independence uh it has changed a bit of course it still uh, is referred to uh, it's used to refer uh, people who are descendants of pure spanish uh, lineage pure spanish heritage in south america but on in an academic circle it has broadened to refer to a, a eurocentric understanding of national and histories and identities eurocentric means thoughts which were are centered around europe and people look at the rest of the world through that lens of european thought so european thought says okay this means this so we have we will see latin america also from these lenses what the problem here is that if you look at a culture which is not part of the original thought like eurocentric thought looking at that culture through this thought will have a lot of problems so so understanding of uh, uh, eurocentrism and criollos is important i think i have given you a, a small brief introduction about both uh, keep this word in mind criollos because uh, uh, we'll come to that how they have defined the latin american cinema in the silent cinema of latin america there was always a criollo aesthetics in one of in one is uh, which was uh using a kind of visual language and uh, narrative structures which were mostly metropolitan because most of these criollos were uh, situated around the urban center in that time i'm talking about like 100 years back kind of a thing uh so they didn't have much of rural uh, landscape much of history but mostly metropolitan but whose atmospheres Uh, concerns and characters were definitely local national and regional okay criollos may be uh, having a spanish descent tree but that didn't mean that they were referring to spain all the time the issues discussed in these films were local national and always uh, regional which means that uh, now we need to understand who was dominating the early latin american cinema 
once we come to know who dominates the cinema we can see how the cinema has been defined latin american cinema from the beginning was defined by middle class and upper class upper middle class politicians and business people who set out to who were who, who wanted to maximize the film's huge potential for profits and propaganda now propaganda is something which we have seen in many other films so we can see that the same film industries and we can see that the same thing is happening in uh, was happening in latin american cinema also something which is unique to latin american cinema which was not there in any other film industry which we have discussed in now is the involvement of the religious institutions in that country at that time which have been involved in productions since the beginning of cinema the religious institutions in uh, latin america was very much active and it has continued to play even now an active role in media production okay even now the religious institutions the people have a say in how the media products are shaped so some, that's something unique to latin american cinema which is not there in many other uh, cinematic uh, uh, industries if you look at if you, if you remember your iran video you can see that the religious institutions and religious clergy in that country was opposed to cinema but in latin america whatever religious institution was there at that time uh, which was dominant which was having a control on people's uh, minds and society was in favor of cinema but he wanted to also regulate cinema and make use of it in how in manners which the religious institution wanted and how its cinema served its own purpose the creole sensibility of the time was not only eurocentric but also thoroughly patriarchal we know what patriarchy is male dominance not giving enough respect to women not recognizing issues of women objectifying women um scandalizing women making women look like sex objects you can if you look at the cinema of latin america you can see why this happened and you can see why the periods of that film are uh, androcentric and often misogynistic which means they are totally against uh interests of women and they use women mostly as eye candy so, uh, for the visual pleasure but not making really making the women uh, the woman or the female star or female issues as the center point it was always male centered male dominated patriarchal uh latin american cinema uh, beginning with the general observation that um, silent film uh, production silent film production in latin american cinema um the earlier 1920s earlier 19 uh, sorry 100 120 years back you can see that it was developed in three distinct stages the first one was what they call actualities roughly between 1897 to 1907 uh second was second stage was proto narrative cinema from 1908 to 15 and from then on it has been the third stage that is feature narrative cinema from 1915 to 1930 Uh, now if you look at these three uh, stages the first one started in 1897 and you can know that the the birth of film was lumia brothers 19, 1895 so roughly one and a half two years after the first uh, film was first film was displayed by lumia brothers it had reached uh, latin america but they were showing actuality which means uncut uh rough footages of uh, things going on just like lumiere's brothers trains uh, the second uh, stage was 1908 to 1915 proto narrative cinema means cinema has not yet achieved the 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 perfection of narrative it has right now but the stages were being set between these years so the second phase was proto narrative cinema and the third stage began in 1915 and you know why 1915 is important because d w griffith's uh, birth of the nation came in that particular year which is considered 
as the birth of narrative cinema and in the same year you can say that latin american cinema was also uh, beginning to show signs of uh, production in feature narrative cinema so there were three different phases in the beginning which have influenced cinema even now okay uh, the latin american uh, filmmakers have always been uh, adventurous spirits i love uh, seeing their work because you know you can see different kinds of things happening it's always watching an, a latin american movie for me is like an adventure and that's why i say that uh, the filmmakers have always been uh, very adventurous uh, spirit spirits and uh, and and they have and they were influenced right from the beginning they have been influenced uh, from three prominent uh, reference three prominent influences have been there on latin cinema at the level of visual and uh, narrative practices right uh, so first influence was the hollywood cinema definitely the production techniques of hollywood cinema the narrative techniques of hollywood cinema uh, european cinema for the artistic and aesthetic uh, uh, values they have incorporated from the european cinema the commercial aspects they have taken from hollywood cinema and the third influence was the latin american documentary cinema these three again are the influences for uh, the early latin cinema and uh, even now you can see that they are still continuing but they have been a lot of uh, um, uh, how do you put it discrepancies in, in between after especially during the world war 2 you can see by now there's a pattern of, of world war 2 coming in between and creating chaos during uh, its period in most of the industries that we saw that in japanese we saw that in chinese we saw that in uh, iranian uh, movies even in latin america we had a lot of uh, chaos during world war 2 okay some of the famous films uh, at that time was uh, gaucho nobility in uh, 1915 it was made in argentina Uh, remember that Latin American cinema is not just one country. This is made in Argentina. Another film was made in Argentina in 1916, The Last Indian Uprising. That's also a very good uh, movie. It was also made in Argentina. Um, uh, the Grey uh, Automobile by uh, sorry in 1919, Mexico. Uh, the Grey Automobile was. Uh, produced in 1919 this is in uh, mexico forgive me mother <clears throat> in argentina in 1927 mineros blood in brazil in 1920 and you can see that uh, argentina was kind of leading i have said i have told you five movies three of them are argentinians argentine uh, argentina was kind of um, uh, leading mexico and brazil were there but they were argentina was on the uh four front but something happened later which we'll come to which killed which destroyed the uh, lead which argentine argentinian cinema had okay so from silent movies in uh, latin america we go to something called avant-garde silent cinema we have to talk about a little about avant-garde cinema because avant-garde cinema of latin america has influenced other avant-garde cinema in contrast to the conservation conventionalism of criollo cinema criollo cinema was very very conventional uh you know like formula okay and and uh, in in retaliation to this uh, conventional cinema uh, of criollos avant-garde films uh started experimenting with non formulaic uh, narratives and with the non realist film cinematography that included like extreme uh, angle shots a fragmentation of the projected images like the images are not like this might be like this might be you know fragmented there might be many eyes here um, and even shots ma- made with camera sometimes they were tied to a rope and thrown in the air the camera was tied so tied to the rope and thrown in the air and it comes down they take the shot brilliant this is like 100 years back a technology so we don't need to judge it from today's uh, perspective uh some of the films which have been uh, uh very famous from uh the silent avant-garde movie or movie four four have survived four are considered four movies from that era are considered very um uh, famous and very nice that is one is sao paulo uh, metropolitan symphony in 
29. This was produced in Brazil. Uh, Limit, it was also produced in Brazil in uh, 1929. Que Viva Mexico, it was by Sergei Eisenstein. Uh, it was done in Mexico and United States in 1931. And Ganga Bruta, gang, uh, raw gang in Brazil in 1933. So here we have discussed the silent cinema of uh, Latin America. Of course, whatever I've said is only an introduction. You have to go and read more. I've included links. Even those links are not enough. You need to go and read more about these cinemas which I have uh, talked about. So uh, we'll take a break and I will, uh, you know, go to the next part, which is the studio cinema. We come now to the next phase called uh, the studio cinema. We have seen Silent Era some time back and uh, we have now reached studio cinema from an economic uh, perspective you know what studio cinema is by now uh, we have seen classical Hollywood cinema in Latin America studios were also there the studio system was there but they were acting more like a B film factory of uh, uh, Hollywood which is dependent on Hollywood majors for distribution so Hollywood was a large part was there present and the studio system was taking um, a lot of help and a lot of domination from the Hollywood cinema. Broadly speaking, studio cinema in Latin America developed in uh, four phases. The first one is transition to sound from silent cinema to sound in the early 1930s. Uh, it was following Hollywood for most of the time. Uh, some of the famous films of those era was are uh, The Day You Love Me, 1935. Let's go with uh, let's go with Pancho Villa in 1935. The Three Amateurs uh, in 1933. Now, Three Amateurs is uh, some kind of important because it pursued a strategy of differentiation from Hollywood productions. It was not like typical Hollywood productions. Uh, the second phase was early studio cinema from 1936 to 1942. The unprecedented box office success of three musicals from 1936. Uh, out on the Big Ranch in Mexico, uh, Help Me to Live in Argentina, in uh, and uh, Hello Hello Carnival in Brazil, uh, convinced local investors that national cinema was important. National cinema in that particular country was important and it's time that we shake off Hollywood's dominance. Consequently, a lot of students, uh, sorry, consequently a lot of studios grew in uh, Brazil Mexico and Argentina, while the first industrial style studios were established in mid sized countries like Venezuela, Peru, Chile, sorry, Chile and Cuba. Uh, in 1943, a landmark movie came Maria Candelaria, which put Mexican cinema on the world map after it won prizes at Cannes and Locarno. Uh, the third phase of studio cinema is between 19 and 1950, which is known as the heydays of the studios. At this time, 19, you can see that the time is 1943 to 50, World War II time. Uh, Argentina's lead, I was telling Argentina was leading some time back. Argentina's lead seemed to be secure until the United States, uh, as part of the broad Pan American strategy, uh, to uh, convince this Latin American peoples to join. World War II on uh, their side punished Argentina because Argentina was neutral. So Argentina was neutral at that time. So the US said, even if you are neutral, we are going to stop supplying uh, resources and uh, materials for you to make your cinema. With that, Argentina suffered a lot. On the other hand, Mexico supported US. So US in turn supported Mexico with a lot of materials, a lot of help. Uh, so gradually Argentina's lead in cinema making came down whereas the lead of Mexico went up. And uh, the last phase of studio cinema was in 1950s when World War II ended. Uh, Mexico was already now leading. Argentina had gone down. Now United States backtracked and said, okay, enough of help to Mexico. You now stay as a secondary unit for us like you were before the war. Thanks for supporting, but now get back to your old position.
uh, that was kind of not sitting right with Latin American people, and you know, uh, it helped. Uh, it helped in a lot of filmmakers trying to come out out of the domination of Hollywood. It was already there. Cinema was beautiful in Latin America, but this uh, thing made the people want to come out of the dominance. Also, another thing was local audiences had grown tired of formulaic products, which were coming from Hollywood and which were uh, influencing the local cinema. So they wanted something very different. Okay. So by 1950s, however, the films that address social and psychological themes uh, more directly and through innovative cinematic forms found a receptive audience. The audience which was fed up with formulaic lovey dovey stuff were now looking for uh, psychological, social theme related films and, uh, and these were rapidly growing in urban centers throughout the South American region. Commercial theatres regularly played Italian neorealism, as you can see that Italian neorealism has influenced Latin American cinema also, uh, as well as uh, psychological dramas of Ingmar Bergman or the Japanese uh, master uh, Yasujiro Ozu or uh, Robert Branson. Now we come to a very important person, Louis Bunel. He was a Spaniard actually from Spain. Uh, he had already made a name for himself as a French surrealistic filmmaker. And he also made another movie called uh, La, La, The Golden Age, uh, which was in France in 1930. And then he came to Latin America in the 1950s. One of his most famous movies and it's considered one of the best movies of Latin cinema of all time is Los Bolivadados. Okay, And it was Bunel's first person film in Mexico. Uh, so, to read more about Louis Bunel, I'll write his name down in the mail, read more about him. The 1950s and 1960s saw a movement towards third cinema, led by Argentine filmmakers uh, Fernando Solan Solanas and Octavio uh, Gettino. Now, don't worry about third cinema, I'll be making a separate video on third cinema. Uh, so, uh, third cinema is a complete different topic. As of now, you can understand that Latin American cinema was a very important part of the third cinema. We will come to third cinema in the different uh, uh, topic which we have uh, said. Uh, besides third cinema, in Brazil, uh, there was a movement called Cinema Novo. Uh, movement created this, this movement created a particular way of making movies with critical and intellectual screenplays. Uh, they had a better photography related to light of the outdoors in a tropical landscape. And these films, Cinema No uh, Films of Brazil movement, had always a political message. Read more about uh, Cinema Nouveau. It's a genre of mo genre and movement of film. It's both a film as well as a it's both a film genre as well as a film moment it came in brazil during 1960s and 70s it actually means new cinema in portuguese uh, it's more of brazil so read more about uh, cinema novo uh, more recently uh, a new style of directing and uh, stories film has been tagged as new latin american cinema that's something new which has come contemporary we have we have reached the current times now uh, although this label was also used in uh, 1960s and 70s movies, the new Latin American cinema was part of a global phenomenon that includes uh, new cinemas in Africa, Europe, Asia and North America. Okay, so I wanted to read more about Cinema Nuvo. Third cinema, I will take a separate uh, class, a uh, separate video lecture on that. It's, it includes many other things. So. I'll conclude with the list uh, of some great movies from the Latin American film industry. Uh, Bra I'll, uh, I'll give you a list of Brazilian movies. One of my personal favorites, I, and I've seen this movie many, many, many times over the last uh, 18 years or so since it has come out, is called Cidade de Du, uh, City of God. Anybody who's anybody who knows the Brazilian cinema knows this movie. It talks of it. It 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 uh, explores the lives of people living in Brazilian ghettos and how small children uh, get into crime at a very early age. Beautiful movie, very poetic, 
very violent at the same time. It was directed by Fernando Meriele and uh, Katie Kasia Lund. Another, another name, <coughs> another film of uh, Latin American Brazilian movie is uh, Pihoti, 1981, uh, Bye Bye Brazil, 1979, and Bossa Nova in 2000. These are some of the uh, good uh, movies, examples of good Brazilian movies. Uh, now we come to Argentine movies. There's a, in 2000, there was a movie called Nine Queens, beautiful movie. Uh, Pizza, Bira and Faso, that means Pizza, Beer and Cigarettes in 1980, 1998. That's the second movie which I recommend. The Man Next Door in 2009. And of course, the most famous Argentine film, The Son of the Bride in 2001. Okay. Of course, uh, now we come to the Mexican movie. And one of the most uh, famous Mexican movie I've already said, Louis Bunel's uh, 1950 classic, Los Olvidados. Another movie is uh, Santa Sangre uh, in 1989. Another movie came in 2004 called The Duck Season. Beautiful movie. And uh, Alamar in 2009 are some of the good examples of Mexican movies. Uh, these three are the, these three, like I said, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico form the core of Latin American uh, film industry. But there are other films also. I don't have time to discuss all of uh, them. You go and read about Latin American movie. Venezuela has some good movies. Chile has done some good movies. There are some good movies which have come out from Bolivia, Peru. Che Guevara was a good, uh, was a very influential person, not only in the revolution, but also he, he inspired a lot of movies. Uh, which And if you look at those movies, you get a different perspective about Che Guevara. I'm sure you know who Che Guevara is. If you don't know, please go and read about Che Guevara. So let me conclude uh, the session of Latin America. Uh, let me say that for as long as cinema has been around, uh, Latin America has produced stories and storytellers who have changed the game. Uh, not just in filmmaking, but also in the industry, in the culture, in the cinematic process, making uh, film cinema, cinema making process around them. Now, the earlier generation of filmmakers was inspired by anti-imperialist solidarity. This that is, you know, always going uh, against the domination by the first world, because South America was considered as a third world and uh, you know, the first world was always taking advantage of the third world. Uh, second world was also taking advantage of the uh, third world at that time. So many filmmakers of the earlier generations were inspired by anti-imperialist uh, solidarity uh, and the fin financial support they received among uh, their fellow new Latin American cinema peers, that is Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Brazil, to name a few. In contrast, today's authors, today's authors, we have discussed author theory in the class. Today's authors, cinema makers were considered authors. They they have a different way of approaching filmmaking. They travel towards travel across the world, go to film festivals, display their movie, talk about them, bring awareness to the issues which are pertaining to cinema industry in their country, in their continent. Uh, they promote their more personal works and they also try to rise, uh, sorry, raise some funds and also strike some uh, distribution deals. Also, uh, a lot of filmmakers today in Latin America are film making films that are not political, like the earlier generation took a very political stand in their film in Latin America. Today's filmmakers don't go for too much of overly political movies, but they want to explore other serious issues like marginalized identities, gender, race, issues relating to LGBTQ, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> issues relating to, relating to LGBTQ, gender, race, class, on so with that we come to the end of today's session on uh, Latin American cinema, we say Jai Hind.